Hi, I'm Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thank you for joining our Ask the Expert chat on scoliosis. We are going to be chatting with neurosurgeon Dr. Katherine Hose from the UT Southwestern O'Donnell Brain Institute. Dr. Hose specializes in complex spine disorders and sees patients at our spine center as well as UT Southwestern Neurosurgery at Texas Health Dallas, one of our newer locations. So please remember that Dr. Hose cannot answer specific medical questions due to patient privacy laws, and we wanna be respectful of that, but we will certainly take as many questions as we can get to. So don't forget to like and share this conversation. We want it to reach the far corners of the web and add your comments in the comments section of this feed. So Dr. Hose, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, so I'm curious, maybe we start out with just a definition. Can you tell us what scoliosis is? Absolutely. I think when people look up the term, it's rather broad. Scoliosis radiographically is an abnormal curve to the spine that can be in either the three segment cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, but often it spans the full gamut in the side to side dimension coronally or the front to back sagittally. Okay. So, what causes it? The causes are as, bro as broad as the patients who suffer with the condition. Mm -hmm. um, I separate it into two categories, those that are afflicted early in life mm -hmm. and those that come along maybe perhaps in adulthood. Okay. Um, juvenile or adolescent idiopathic scoliosis can be from weakness of the muscles, okay. uh, nerve disorders such as cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. or just global imbalances even functionally such as posture. If one rests in a certain position as bones form, it's they can stay in that position as one ages. Ah. And then as we become adults, there are other things, mm -hmm. things that could cross from childhood into adulthood, mm -hmm. or asymmetric disc disease, for example. Mm -hmm. Wear and tear in our bones and joints, we get arthritis. Right. Our joints wear, and then their ability to support the load of our trunk head shifts as well. Okay, so you mentioned you know, that you know, when you're growing, sitting like this is not ideal. I see a lot of young people sitting that way. I mean, what, what are some ways that they can prevent their spine from shifting? I think whenever I counsel my patients, it always comes back to a healthy lifestyle. Um, being mindful of one's posture, mm -hmm. seated firmly in a chair, squarely, shoulders back, and working on ergonomics. Okay. Um, those are my best advice for someone growing up. Uh, we okay. don't reach scale to maturity until perhaps 12 at the earliest, mm -hmm. but it often depends on the onset of puberty. Okay. So as we age, we have to be very mindful in that range. Okay, good to know. So I start seeing some questions start to come in, and one of them actually came in ahead of time, and we're going to start with Kathy's question, and it is, how is scoliosis related to leg pain? She says that she has scoliosis in her cervical spine, but has horrible leg pain too, especially in the back of the thighs. Is that normal? It's very common. Often the people who visit me in clinic have some sort of pain, either neck, arms, legs, or back. Mm -hmm. One must remember that the brain controls everything from head down. And then at the segments of the body, nerves come off from the spinal cord and give us our function to our arms and legs. Okay. So if someone's not aligned properly, mm -hmm. or if there's a shift closing down around a nerve, that can pass pain onto an extremity such as the leg. Okay, that, that makes sense. Great question. Thank you for submitting it and joining us. So we've got another question here. Um, do you have back pain if you have scoliosis? And what are the symptoms? So two parts there. Let's sure. start with the first one. Do you have back pain if you have scoliosis? A lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. Okay. Um, scoliosis, just like many things, has a shade of gray to it. Mm -hmm. There can be severe deformity and also much milder. Okay. So those with a perhaps milder curve may not manifest with pain symptoms. Whereas as the curve progresses or as the spine deforms around the nerves, perhaps pain does manifest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, you may or you may not. Okay. But often if you're seeking care, that's one of the first symptoms people come for. Okay, and that, that's the second part of her question is what are the symptoms of scoliosis? Um, again, back pain, neck pain. Mm -hmm. um, Often people will find that throughout the course of the day, they have difficulty maintaining an erect posture. They slope forward or they need to sit or lay down as the pain gets worsened and then alleviates with changes in position. Um, 
sometimes in very severe cases of compression upon the nerves or spinal cord, mm -hmm. there could be more severe symptoms, okay. numbness, tingling, weakness. Oh. At the most severe changes that become more permanent, bowel bladder loss of mm -hmm. control, incontinence or impotence. Okay, that's, that's a lot. Some of those sound scarier than others. You know, when you're talking about that and somebody comes in to thinking that they might have scoliosis, what are some of the options that are there for treatment? I know they're not all surgical. Absolutely, that's a great question. Depending on when you manifest, we look at you as a whole person. Mm -hmm. We try to be very holistic in our thoughts about how is someone presenting to us? How do we get them to their optimal functional status? So if I'm seeing someone younger who's not reached skeletal maturity, perhaps I can brace them mm -hmm. or put an external immobilization device to help them maintain a correct posture. Um, if there's someone older in life where their bones are wearing from osteoporosis, mm -hmm. I may target that with medicines or supplements to strengthen the bones. Okay. Um, so there's a variety of things to help people feel better. Okay. Um, I personally like to practice from most conservative, least invasive, on up to the spectrum of what I can offer as a surgeon. Okay, so start off with the least invasive method and then kind of go down that path if needed. And it okay. depends on how people are coming to me, how severe is their disease at the outset of seeing someone in their care team. Okay, so you mentioned age, and we actually want to find out, is there an age limit for scoliosis? Is it, I hear that most often happening in children, but obviously adults get it too. It definitely affects everyone through the span of the whole lifespan. Um, I don't think there's a limit to when someone begins to be affected, mm -hmm. nor is it something that's terminal. Um, sometimes there needs to be intervention to help correct the deformity so that people can be functional. Mm -hmm. um, just as not everyone's a robust 90-year-old, not everyone's a robust teenager. Right. So we have to look at how someone's doing overall mm -hmm. before we say how aggressive can we be to help them. Okay, good to know. So the question, next question is from Caroline, and it's, are there any activities like running that should be avoided if you have scoliosis? Thankfully, people with scoliosis can live full lives. Great. Um, Again, uh, minus the extremes where there can be um, difficulty with breathing from okay. a, a severe curve through the thoracic spine, mm -hmm. difficulty feeding, bathing, mm -hmm. most people are upright, walking around, and living normal lives. Mm -hmm. So I would not discourage running. On the contrary, I encourage at least 30 minutes of active, healthy lifestyle per day if you can manage. All right, great question, Caroline. We're so glad you could join us. You know, to, th to that end, what are some exercises or physical activities that are good for people that may have curvature of the spine? Um, one of the biggest things I emphasize is overall core health. Okay. Um, our back muscles are synergistic with those of the abdominal wall. So encouraging someone to have a strong core can be very helpful. People have also found benefit through activities such as Tai Chi and yoga to help okay. with relaxation mm -hmm. and stretching. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. That sounds, sounds really helpful. So let's see, we've got some more questions coming in here. I think the next one is, when should someone see a doctor? It's often very hard to navigate the healthcare system, mm -hmm. and I find the longer people wait, the more anxiety creeps up. So I personally encourage, if someone has a question or concern about their health, to seek health care management early. Okay. Um, I don't think there's ever too early. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's helpful to catch things when they're mild to follow them and see how they change in time. One of the biggest um, markers for scoliosis is the angle of the curve. Mm -hmm. So if we're catching it before it's meeting the criteria, which is about 20 degrees mm -hmm. of a Cobb angle change, maybe we can do something to help um, less aggressively and without surgical intervention. But certainly if someone's coming to us more severe, it doesn't mean we can't help them too. Okay, good to know. Great questions here. So we're about 10 minutes into our chat, so make sure you keep those questions coming. We want to make sure that we get all of them answered. You know, one of them that came in earlier was somebody was curious how scoliosis is diagnosed. Like, what did, I know as a child, a lot of times they have you, you know, lean forward and they look at your, is that the same when you're an adult? Some of those do apply. Again, a lot of the people who manifest in adulthood perhaps had symptoms as an adolescent or juvenile mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or pediatric patient. So one of the earliest that most of us remember is childhood screening, sports physicals, mm -hmm. where you bend forward and someone stands behind you looking at the curve of the thoracic cage. Sometimes it can be an obliquity to either the shoulders or the pelvis where they're not quite set okay. in an appropriate alignment or there can be a rib hump or an elevation of the back as 
the bones have rotated out of register. Okay. So that's a very common way that people used to screen. Mm -hmm. um, now when I see people in the office, I do a full assessment of strength, sensation, reflexes, and I'll actually look at them from behind, taking note of where the shoulders sit, mm -hmm. where the pelvic crests sit, okay. and palpate each of the spine bones to feel are they rotating, how prominent is one versus another. Okay, interesting. Um, by and large, beyond the physical exam, it's a radiographic diagnosis. Your uh, healthcare professional will probably do x-rays of you on a forward angle and from the side mm -hmm. and make measurements along the vertebral bodies. Oh, wow. Okay, sounds, sounds really fancy nowadays. I enjoy it. <laughs> Great question. So we've got, we've got one here from Tony, and this is kind of interesting. Is there any link between environmental factors such as pollution and, inst and instances of scoliosis? That's an interesting of question. I would think if there's factors in your environment that limit your quality of life, mm -hmm. certainly there could be a link. Mm -hmm. um, Without knowing exactly what are the pollutants, it's hard to answer. Right. Um, but if you're having less exercise, for example, because you're in an urban area where the air quality is not as good, perhaps that could have a bearing. By and large, scoliosis is a musculoskeletal disease. If mm -hmm. the muscles are weak or pulling abnormally, the okay. bones come out of register. Mm -hmm. So although that's an indirect answer, I think that perhaps there could be an environmental cue to this. Okay, okay. So perhaps if maybe they live in an area with high pollution and so they spend their day in their lazy boy recliner and aren't able to get out, then it sounds that could be possible. Okay, great question. Thanks for asking. You know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, how we diagnose it. We've talked a little bit about some of the options. I mean, in the most advanced cases, there is surgery. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that entails? Absolutely. Surgery has come a long way. Um, one of the forefronts of neurosurgical advance and innovation has been focused on the spine. It's a very physical, biomechanical process mm -hmm. of correction. Um, ages ago, there used to be something called Harrington rods, mm -hmm. where it looked much like a shower rod that you would extend to straighten out a curve. We've gotten a lot more sophisticated Sounds since painful. then. Um, we can do open correction techniques. We can do minimally invasive techniques. Um, many times we use what are called screws. Mm -hmm. um, they go into a part of the bone that can bear them. And then we connect them, much like railroad tracks, to realign, derotate, and follow someone back to their more normal posture. Wow. And how long does that take? I assume that's not something that happens overnight. No. Um, surgery for these can, again, depending on the severity, can be mm -hmm. maybe an hour or two, or it can be a whole day endeavor. Often for the more complex uh, surgeries for scoliosis, two surgeons that are expert in the disease process are working in tandem to be efficient, safe, and move it along as fast as possible. Okay. But it's definitely something for an expert surgeon to take care of. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of what the strength is in having a complex multidisciplinary team is recognizing mm -hmm. cases that need to be referred on mm -hmm. to higher levels of care. Okay, good to know. So we've got some, a couple last minute questions coming in. We've got one from Mendy, and she says, you mentioned core strength previously. So how does pregnancy impact women with scoliosis? Great question. Oh, I love that question. In pregnancy, our bodies go through something very dynamic. We increase our circulating blood volume. Our ligaments of the pelvics relax. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pregnant women will manifest with pain Absolutely. in the, what's called the sacroiliac junction or the main ligaments between the mid part of the pelvis, the sacrum, and that which wraps around to support our hips. So that can actually increase pain in some. Depending on how severe the curve is going through the lumbar or thoracic spine, perhaps as the child grows within, mm -hmm. it changes how the woman carries herself. Absolutely. And can manifest new changes of uh, pain or neurologic symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, certainly as the nerves exit from the lumbosacral spine, they're coming through the pelvis right where the, uh, the baby sits. Mm -hmm. So that too can manifest in other ways. Okay. So once the baby is delivered, does that then change everything again? It can. Um, it doesn't happen right away. Mm -hmm. Just as the ligaments gradually re relax through the pregnancy, they gradually come back to their normal register. Okay. The body's wow. a beautiful dynamic thing. <laughs> it certainly is. That's a great question. We're so glad you could join us today. So what is the difference between child scoliosis and adult scoliosis, or is there not one? There's definitely a distinction in age of those um, diagnosed. Um, 
I won't say that one's more severe than an another because I've certainly had challenges caring for pediatric patients with deformity, adolescent patients with deformity, adults and geriatric patients. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to make a distinction other than age. I will say that those with pediatric scoliosis sometimes have congenital deformity okay. where perhaps um, as they were born their bones have not formed along the path as you would normally expect through pediatric years. There can be hemivertebra, wedge vertebra, um, spina bifida where it's not completely formed around the neural column um, or even what we call gibbous deformity where segments of bones form in an abnormal way. Okay. They're some of the most challenging cases I've ever taken care of. Um, adults, for example, most of them have sagittal plane imbalance, mm -hmm. where it's that front back diameter, okay. the curving of the top of the spine, or flexing of the hips to help the lower okay. back sit. They're compensating for it? Exactly. Okay. The head naturally wants to stay above the pelvis. Mm -hmm. So as our bodies come out of alignment, they're trying to correct on ways that they can. Okay. So, and to the question, um, severity and age are some of the ways people distinguish child versus adult onset scoliosis, but it's more shades of gray. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like in many, as in many medical issues, there are lots of shades of gray with scoliosis. Okay. So, a couple more questions. We're running out of time here. I did want to find out one other thing. You've talked about the elderly, about kids. It sounds like anybody can get scoliosis. Are there certain groups that are more prone to it? I think there's definitely groups that are more prone to it. Um, adults with poor bone quality, osteoporotic, they mm -hmm. tend to manifest with weak bones that mm -hmm. either shift in height or shift in lateral translation. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, compression fractures are very common in that population. Okay. You can think if you have a traumatic force to a bone, losing height or losing its ability to maintain structural integrity will mm -hmm. get scoliosis. Okay, okay. Um, children born with neuromuscular disorders, it's been, again, that cerebral palsy, um, certainly that population are very um, afflicted and that can manifest even before skeletal maturity, unfortunately. Okay, so we do have, we have another question and this one's from Cindy and it's a, it's a sensitive question, but it, I'm curious and it's, can scoliosis be a result of child abuse? Hmm. That is a sensitive subject. It's very. Um, no one ever really wants to think about yeah. those cases in that they're very thought-provoking and emotional. It's not that people shy away from child abuse cases, but it's very complex socioeconomically, certainly. Okay. Um, and those of child abuse from malnutrition, neglect, you can imagine that they're weaker yeah. or might um, not have the muscle strength that other children their age or yeah. with other health conditions similar to theirs would have. In the case of physical abuse, certainly if there's trauma strong enough to break bones, that could be something that results with deformity as the bones heal in time. Mm -hmm. okay. Great question. We're glad you could join us, Cindy. So we have time for one more question. and I'm. It's about so the older adults that have scoliosis. I mean, when somebody comes in and let's say they're in their, their 70s, their 80s, and they have scoliosis, what are some kind of those, again, those non-surgical options that can improve their quality of life? We try to target what is, what is the goal for that patient. Mm -hmm. Are they trying to get back to golf? Do they want to walk through the grocery store and not lean forward on a cart? Mm -hmm. um, so if pain is one of the manifesting symptoms, perhaps we can do non-invasive things mm -hmm. such as physical therapy, okay. acupuncture, or less invasive things such as targeted injections. Sometimes mm -hmm. we want to narrow down what is the nerve or what is the bone joint that's being affected and we can use these strategies to help us figure out how do we get someone a robust result. Okay, okay. so it's all about what is that individual person's goal. Absolutely, great way to say it. Okay, all right, well we are we are all out of time for this chat. I want to thank I want to thank you, Dr. Hose, for joining us and for answering all these questions. It was such a pleasure. I, I'm happy the community wants to learn more, and I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting everyone I can. Absolutely. Well, we're glad to have you at UT Southwestern, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. This chat will be available here on Facebook if you want to watch it again, and it'll also be on our YouTube channel later this afternoon. So tune in there. 
and have a wonderful day.